Welcome back. I hope you had a nice break and I hope you got a new cup of tea. Now we're going to look at the chemistry of acids and bases and it's the sort of thing you probably talked about when you were at school. Let's start with the basic definitions of what is an acid and what is a base. And for the purposes of our discussion we're going to use the Bronsted-Lowry theory. You may have heard of that but it simply posits that an acid is a proton donor and a base is a proton acceptor. Okay, so an acid can give a proton, a base can accept a proton. Before we look at the chemistry of acids and bases in a bit more detail, I just want to make one point, which is that the Bronsted-Lowry theory doesn't actually define what chemical moieties are acids and bases. It simply says an acid is anything which can donate a proton and a base is anything that can accept a proton. One kind of important outcome from this is that potassium hydroxide, for instance, if I asked you, I think you'd say potassium hydroxide is a very strong uh, base. The Bronsted-Lowry theory doesn't actually consider potassium hydroxide to be a base because it itself can't accept a proton. Rather, it considers it to be a salt that contains a basic moiety, which is the OH-. So when that dissolves and dissociates in water, the OH- minus group, that can accept a proton. So the Bronsted-Lowry theory considers potassium hydroxide, for instance, to be a salt with a basic moiety within it. So let's look at the chemistry of bases first, and I usually start with bases because most drugs are basic. So if you get the basic drug chemistry right, then acid drug chemistry is the reverse. But I always think it's easier to start with um, bases. So in simple terms, if our drug is a base, we need to react it with a strong acid in order to make a salt. So that chemical reaction is shown on the screen. B is the base. HCl is the strong salt we're reacting with. So what will happen is the hydrochloric acid will dissociate in water, forming a proton and a chloride ion. The base will then accept the proton, that's the definition of a base, with Bronsted-Lowry theory to form BH+, and Cl-, the chloride ion, remains in solution. It's kind of important here that BH+, which is one of the intermediates that's being formed prior to the salt, is a conjugate acid. Now, conjugate means it's part of another molecule, and so those two, the chloride ion and the BH plus, come together to form BH plus Cl minus, which is the actual salt form. When that dissolves in water, as I'm going to look at in just a second, it's going to dissociate BH plus and Cl minus. BH plus is conjugate acid because, Bronsted-Lowry theory again, BH plus is a moiety capable of donating a proton. It's called a conjugate acid because it's within uh, another molecule, but when it dissociates, it itself is an acidic species. Okay, it's kind of important to um, recognise that. So we add base and hydrochloric acid together. We form BH plus and Cl minus, and they then come together to form the salt, which is BH plus Cl minus, which is electrically neutral. And obviously, you're going to recognise that um, as a hydrochloride salt. Okay. Why is this important? It becomes important when we dissolve the uh, hydrochloride salt into water. So again, on the screen is the chemical reaction for what will happen. So the first thing that will happen when we put the salt into water is it will dissociate and it will form BH plus and Cl minus. As I said already, BH plus is a conjugate acid because it's capable of donating a proton. What will happen, therefore, is you take your salt form, BH plus Cl minus, and you dissolve it in water. It will disperse and dissociate BH plus plus Cl minus. The BH plus, which is a conjugate acid, then donates a proton to water, forming H3O plus. Now, if you're following the chemistry here, what that means is when you dissolve your basic salt form in water, what you end up with is a solution of base, because the free base has been reformed, plus the solution has become a little bit acidic, okay? Because ultimately what you did was every molecule of basic drug that you dissolve is attached to a molecule of hydrochloric acid. And once the chemistry is played out, you end up with free base plus a molecule of hydrochloric acid. It's a little bit like dissolving the free base 
into an acidic solution. The more of the free base that you dissolve, the more hydrochloric acid is also being dissolved, and so the pH is dropping. We haven't looked at the solubility profiles yet, but it's uh, important to remember here that as the pH drops, the solubility of basic compounds tends to increase. So right there is all the reasons you need to understand why the solubility of salts is generally higher than their free acid or base counterparts. Starting with a basic salt, every molecule of a basic salt contains a conjugate acid. When you dissolve it in water, the free base is reformed and in addition, a molecule of acid is dissolved. Therefore, when you dissolve a basic salt in water, the pH starts to drop and it's the reduction in pH which is causing the increase in solubility. There's one really important consequence of the fact that it's the, it's the dissolution of the salt itself which is causing the change in pH of the dissolution medium. Because if you then dissolve your salt in a buffered medium, the fact that there is a conjugate acid there and the pH will drop is irrelevant because the buffer itself will mop up the additional protons. Okay, So what that means is if you take a basic salt and you dissolve it in water, just plain water, there will be a reduction in pH. And that reduction can be quite significant, as I'll show you in just a second. But if you take that basic salt and you dissolve it in a buffer, the buffer acts to mop up any of the protons that are released and there'll be no change in pH. Because the change in pH is what creates the increase in solubility, when you dissolve a salt in a buffer, there is no change in solubility. Now, we haven't talked about it yet, but I have alluded to it a number of times. Your gastrointestinal tract is a long tube along which the pH is constantly changing. Okay? Sometimes the system's not really buffered. So stomach, for instance, is a good example. It's an acidic solution. It's not much buffering going on. But when you get into the small intestine and the large intestine, there's a lot of buffering going on. And so although we have different pH media, we also have buffered media. And it becomes quite important how the salt is going to behave in those different environments because the solubility advantage might not be there because it can't change the pH as it dissolves. Now, much like the graph we looked at earlier, I did spend a bit of time calculating this graph. And yes, it is with the Henderson Hasselbach equation as we looked at, um, at earlier. So this graph on the y axis shows you solution pH and on the x-axis shows you the concentration in molar terms um, of a salt which you might dissolve. There are four lines on here. Each one represents a different pKa of the basic drug uh, you might be dissolving. So basic salt with pKa, pKa 9, 8, 7 and 6 and so on. And so what the lines are showing you is what will be the drop in pH if you dissolve a basic salt with a pKa of... So if I pick the top line, which is a solid black line, that's a pKa of 9. If I pick, for argument's sake, one molar, so if I dissolve a basic salt with a pKa of 9 to a concentration of one molar, then if you read up from 1 on the x-axis to the solid black line and you go across to the y-axis, you'll see you're going to get a, a pH of around about 4.7, 4.6, something like that. Okay, As the pKa... Uh, gets lower, so pKa of 8, you're going to get a pH drop to around about 4.27, it's going to drop down to around about 3.5, uh, and pKa of 6, you're going to be down at a pH of about 3. So I hope you can see from this graph that the pH drop, which you can cause by dissolving a basic salt, can be quite significant. Remember, this is in water, and it's a theoretical maximum, so in, in reality, the pH drop is probably going to be less, and certainly in the body, it's going to be a buffered system. But it's one of the reasons why you've got to be a little bit careful when dissolving salts in the body. Can you imagine that if you were to inject, for instance, a salt intramuscularly, somewhere like that, where there's not a lot of buffering capacity going on, you can cause quite a significant change in pH locally. And that can be one of the reasons why injections can be very painful, because you're effectively changing the local pH and you're probably acidifying it because the base is going to be a, um, uh, the drug's going to be a basic salt and so it's going to be quite um, 
quite painful. That's not so um, important if you um, inject, for instance, into the blood. Partly that's because you can make the injection itself a buffered system, but it's also because blood itself is very well buffered. It's a bicarbonate buffer. But nonetheless, just to make you aware quite how significant a drop in pH you can cause by dissolving a basic salt. And it's the change in pH which is causing the change in solubility. You will be unsurprised to know that the case for acid salts is exactly the same. The chemistry is the same. It's just that um, when we think about solubility and pH changes, everything is reversed. So classic example on the screen in front of you, HA is the acid, obviously, reacting with a strong base, sodium hydroxide. In this case, everything dissociates and reforms. So we get A minus Na plus, which is the salt plus water. We saw that um, graph earlier. In this instance, it's kind of important, A minus Na+, plus, which is now your um, acidic salt, contains a conjugate base. It contains a conjugate base because when you dissolve that in water, A minus Na+, plus, is going to separate to A minus uh, and Na+, plus, so it's going to be ionized. One of those is capable of accepting a proton, and that is the A minus. So it becomes a conjugate base because it can accept a proton. And so what will happen is it will accept a proton. So although you've dissolved it and you've got A minus in solution, it will take a proton from water and it will form AH, <coughs> which is the original free acid again. And now what you're left over with is a molecule of OH minus, which is going to increase the pH of the solution. OK. So the way to think about this is you take your salt former, your salt, which is an acid salt in this case, and an acid salt contains a conjugate base. So when you dissolve it in water, you recover the free acid, but the conjugate base is what changes the pH in the solution. It's a lot easier to understand with basic salts because in the example that I use, the salt former itself is hydrochloric acid. And so mentally, it's very easy to, to accept that you've got a molecule of base, a molecule of hydrochloric acid. So when they dissolve in water, you've got base and hydrochloric acid, and hence the pH drops. It's a little bit harder to see what I'm talking about with acidic salts, because it's not so obvious that an acidic salt contains a conjugate base. But if you sit through it and you work through the chemistry, you'll see that in all cases, you end up recovering the free acid, and increasing the pH of the solution. And as before, it's the increase in the pH of the solution which causes the change in solubility of the drug. So as before, because an acidic salt contains a conjugate base, if you dissolve that acidic salt in water, there'll be an increase in pH and your solubility will change. But if you dissolve it into a buffer, the buffer acts to resist that change in pH and there will be no solubility improvement, exactly the same as for basic salts. So I said right at the start of this lecture, one of the things to recognise is that when you dissolve salts in buffered solutions, there's no change in solubility. And this is the reason why. And it also means that if your primary reason for making your salt is because you're trying to improve the solubility of your compound, you really need to understand what that means for solubility as a function of pH because the body is really a series of compartments of different pHs, most of which are very tightly buffered. And there's a really strong risk that you won't get that solubility enhancement in the body, even though you'll get it in a beaker in the laboratory. This graph is the same graph that we looked at earlier for basic salts, but now it's showing you the increase in pH as you dissolve an acidic salt, calculated in the same way with the henderson hasselbach equation. So the information is the same. pH on the y-axis, concentration on the x-axis, Examples for four different drugs with increasing pKa's, three, four, five, and six. So if I pick uh, the lowest one, which is uh, pKa of three, and I go for one molar again, go up from the x-axis at one molar, hit the dotted and dashed line, which is pKa three, go across, you'll see you've got a P pH of around about 8.2, 8.3. As you go to pKa four, you're at um, pH 8.6, 8.7 pKa5, you're above a pH of 9. pKa6, you're approaching a pH of 10. So again, you, you're creating quite a significant change in solution pH simply by dissolving 
an acidic salt. And all the caveats that I said earlier about you don't want to be doing this in vivo if you're creating a massive change in pH, they apply to acidic salts as well as they do to basic salts. Now, I said at the start, this is a double lecture, and really it's a four hour lecture. So where are we doing this in class? Two hours of talking this week, two hours of talking next week. My experience of giving this lecture is when I get to this point, generally I have to repeat what I've just said because some people aren't quite up to speed with the concepts because these are not easy concepts. So just to recap, you start with a basic salt, but a basic salt contains a conjugate acid. So when it's dissolved, the pH goes down. If you start with an acidic salt, it contains a conjugate base. So when you dissolve it, the pH goes up. It's the change in pH which changes the solubility. And therefore, if you dissolve either of those salts in a buffer, there is no change in pH because the buffer is acting to resist it. And therefore, there's no change in solubility. Those are not easy concepts to get your head around. And if we talk about it in class, generally, someone will ask me and say, could you just repeat that bit, sir? Because I didn't quite follow it. And we talk about it again. There's not really a lot of point in me repeating on camera, at least, everything that I've just said. If you're not following, and it's totally fine not to follow, it's a really difficult concept, and so I'm not expecting you to get it straight away. It's fine to go back and watch what I just said again. But I won't say it again, because you can just rewind the video and watch it again, okay? But where we're doing this in class, we'll probably have several discussions about this um, backwards and forwards. It's also totally fine when we have the... Um, live online sessions to ask me some questions about solubility and pH of, of salts because these are not easy concepts okay so if you need to stop the video go back watch the last few slides again and just keep watching it until you've got those concepts sorted in your mind and if you haven't got them after watching it several times fire me an email and I'll do my best to explain it um, in writing okay I say this now because after the next tea break, this is going to get even more complicated when we look at uh, pH max and then pH microenvironment next week. Right? So imagine that you work for a pharmaceutical company. You've looked at this big table of advantages that you might get by making a salt. The question is, how are you going to decide what salt you're going to use for your product? I've said already, you've got to make it really early, that decision, because you've got to tell the regulatory authority which sort you're going to be developing. So you need to make that decision really, really early. And since this whole lecture series is about pre-formulation, it makes a lot of sense that understanding which sort you might select uh, is in this topic, because you've got to make that decision before you get going. So one thing you can do is that you don't necessarily know what salt formers are actually going to react with your molecule to make a salt. You don't, you don't actually know which salts are available. So it's kind of important to do some sort of screening and see which sorts you might be able to choose from before you then actually choose one of those sorts. It's kind of a chicken and egg thing. You might think, I want to use a hydrochloride salt, but if it doesn't react or it's got really bad properties, it's pointless, right? So what you would do is a salt screen. And you do this on a small scale. And you do it on a small scale because in pre-formulation, you don't have much of your material available, maybe only a, a few milligrams of your drug substance. And you don't want to waste it all by reacting it with various salt formers and finding that some react and some don't. So there's lots of companies that will do salt screening for you, or you can do salt screening yourself if you've got the equipment available. And it's relatively simple. The way it works is it uses a grid. Typically a 96 well plate, because 96 well plates are used in all sorts of other types of biological measurements, and so they're readily available. So that will be laid out uh, eight wells in one direction and 12 wells in the other direction. And so what you do is you change salt former in one direction. So typically in the 12 directions, you've got 12 um, rows, and so you can use 12 different salt formers, one in each row. And then you might change something like the solvent or the solvent polarity. You might use water and organic solvent mixtures to change polarity. You might use just different solvents completely. So you might have water in one line. You might have hexane in another, octanol in another. It doesn't matter what it is, but you can have a whole range of different solvents. And so you can change polarity in one direction and you can change the salt former in the other direction. Then you simply measure out a small amount of your drug in each well, add a small amount of the salt former drop in a small amount of the solvent, and it really is a small amount, it could be say 50 microliters of solvent, so very small, and you let the plate sit and the materials react. 
And then what you do is you have to analyze it in some way. So typically you'd use a laser, so some sort of reflectance spectroscopy uh, to see what's formed because you should see a difference in absorption between free acid or base and salt. And so what you would do is you'd take the plate, you'd put the laser onto it and you'd use the laser in each well and you'd see which combinations of salt former and solvent caused um, a salt to form and which ones didn't. You take the salts that are formed and then you screen them for physicochemical properties and you decide which one that you want to use. But the point about doing this test is it also tells you which solvent you might choose to use in order to synthesize the salt in the first place. If, for instance, salts don't form, then you can do a number of things. So one thing you can do is raise the temperature to try and encourage salts to form. And if you raise it too high, you might actually evaporate all the solvent. Evaporating the solvent can be a good thing because everything that was dissolved in solution has to come out. And sometimes that can force the material to crystallize. And other times it's not so good because it's, it is forcing everything to come out of solution. And you probably wouldn't use that as a production method for a particular salt. But nonetheless, that is an option. And once you've got the salts, you can then do some sort of analysis to work out what you've got. You might get information from the laser, but you'd also do powder X-ray diffraction, which is gold standard if you've got enough material. You could do Raman, something like that. Um, or you could look at DSC. So you don't need much material for DSC, just a few milligrams. You could heat it up and cool it down. You could look for melting point and you can look for entropy of fusion. So for instance, that will allow you to calculate ideal solubility and it would also allow you to rank the relative stabilities of those different salt forms. So on those grounds, you could start to make a rational decision about which salt form you want to use. However, the, one of the problems with salt screening is that you can actually end up with quite a large number of salts. In a way, that's a good thing, because the idea of salt screening is to, is to identify what salts are available. And it's kind of a nice problem to have. You want to take a salt forward for development, and you've got plenty to choose from. When you've got plenty to choose from, you should be able to find one with the right properties for your particular molecule. Okay? So that's, that's a good thing. And also it can be a bad thing because if you've got too much choice, at some point you have to make a choice and that means the other ones have to be discarded and that can also be difficult. So you need some sort of process that you can go through, a logical process to, to allow you to decide which sort you're actually going to take forward for development. Now there's all sorts of processes that you might go through and the one that's on the screen is not by any stretch of the imagination the default. Every company will, ma will have a different set of decisions that they will go through in order to decide which one of the sorts they might take forward. It's just an example of how you might decide which sort to take forward for further development. So on the example I've given, the first thing that you do is you rank in order, what are the most undesirable properties of your salt? So in my example, high gross capacity is the most undesirable characteristic. Let's, for argument's sake, say the drug is going to hydrolyze. And so if it absorbs lots of water, it will degrade. It's going to have terrible stability. So you're looking for a salt form with low high gross capacity. Therefore, the first thing you do is you measure the high gross capacity of your uh, different salts that can be done with dynamic vapor absorption, for instance, and you discard those with really high, high gross capacity. So you set a level above which you say this is unacceptable and you discard those salt candidates. Those ones that are left over, you then screen again. So in the next example of my decision tree is a physical form uh, and solubility. And so what you might say is, OK, I need a physical form which is crystalline, but it's got to be a stable crystalline form and it's got to have good solubility. So again, screen the candidates that are left over, those that don't meet the minimum requirements, maybe they change form, maybe the solubility is a bit poor, discard those. And then what you're left with is hopefully fewer salt forms. And so then you might do something like stress test them. So put them under elevated temperature, high humidity, see how they react to stress testing. Same thing, set some limits, those compounds that fail, discard, and what you should be left with is ideally one, maybe more than one, potential sort forms that you can take forward for development. And at that point, it really comes down to Hobson's choice, which one you think is going to make the best candidate. So you make a decision, that's the one that you take forward for development.
But what's really important is you've gone through a logical process in order to get to that drug candidate, okay? Now, it's your time to have a bit of a think while we have another coffee break. So, this slide says all about hydrochloride salts. I've said already, hydrochloride salts are very common. So if you have a basic drug, reacting it with hydrochloric, uh, hydrochloric acid is very common. So the question is, why? Why do you think hydrochloric acid is the best salt former for basic drugs? What properties does it have that makes it an ideal salt former? And are there any problems? If you watch the video back again, I think you might find earlier, I mentioned a couple of problems with hydrochloric acid. So uh, what are the potential problems of hydrochloride salts that you can think about? So we're gonna stop for a cup of tea and you're gonna write down, say two reasons why you think hydrochloric acid is a good salt former and try and think of four reasons why hydrochloric acid is a potential problem. When you've done that and you've made another cup of tea, come back and watch the next part of the video.